I just want us to take a moment and pause here. Coming out of a long season, some of you, this might be your first time back in church in a long time. Some of you might have th thought that for this last season that God might have forgotten about you. It's not true, he's been there. I encourage you to take a moment, and just begin to pray, God, would you meet me here again? I'm gonna forget about everything that's going on outside these doors, but God, tonight, this is my prayer that you would meet me here again. So just in your own way right now, just begin to pray this prayer, God, would you meet me? Lord, in the midst of this season, let me not forget about the things that you've done. Let me not forget about the ways that you changed my life. And Father, I know that over the last little while I might have been frustrated, but God, would you meet me again? Would you change me again? Would you transform me again? Not so that I can turn around and say, look how great I am, but so that I can point to this lost, this broken, this hurting world and say, look how great my God is. Look what he did for me and he can do the same thing for you. So Father, tonight, Lord, we pray that you would be with us the rest of the night in the same way that you've been with us all the way through. Father, I ask that you would just bless this word. God, I ask that every distraction will be placed aside tonight so that we could focus on what you have. And God, I also pray for me that every word that comes out would be edifying, that we would be building up, but that it would come from you tonight. In your amazing name, Come on, all God's people says tonight. Amen. Awesome. Why don't we give it up for the team? You guys can take your seats. Okay, listen, if you don't know who I am, my name is Taylor. I am one of the youth and the young adult pastors here. And I'm, uh, I've been here since August, and I've been loving just being on staff and hanging out with you guys and the team and, and all that. But... Uh, we are in the first message of a series that we're going to be doing uh, that's going to lead us from now all the way to July. And on, honestly, I'm honored to be the first one to preach this in this series to you guys. In this next series, we're, we're going to be talking about hope and prayer and worship and outreach. And really what, we're gonna, what, we, what we'll be doing is we're going to be looking at some of the foundations of our faith in order to reorient us after this long season that it seems like we might be heading out of. But a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I heard a message. And there's a message from this pastor. And this pastor, he began to talk about his high school senior year schedule. And I'll be honest, I think he was bragging a little bit. And so it got me to thinking about how amazing my senior year schedule was, you guys wanna know what my senior year schedule was? I'm gonna tell you. Period one, vocals. Period two, gym. Period three, band. Period four, video editing. Period five, there was no period five, I was done with school. That was my last semester of high school, and let me tell you, I was so happy and excited for this. And listen, I gamed the system. You know why I gamed the system? I gamed the system because every single one of those classes were university cl credits. And so, I can honestly and proudly tell you tonight, standing in front of you, that the only reason I got into second, uh, post-secondary education is because of vocals, gym, band, and video editing. So, I know, thank you, thank you. I'm proud of my accomplishment there. And, uh, and what happened is I was so excited going into my first day of school until I got into my vocals class, my very first class. 
What happened is this teacher, who was my vocals and my band teacher, she said, guys, we're gonna do something a little bit different this year. She said this, she said, instead of, uh, you know, uh, just playing music Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're gonna change things up because I wanna give you a holistic experience into the world of music. So we had what was called Theory Thursday. It was the worst thing that ever, ever happened to me. And, and, and in fact, let me tell you what happened because I didn't like school and I did not sign up for Theory Thursday. I signed up for vocals and band. I had skipping Thursday. I didn't show up to a class uh, Thursday all semester long. It was wonderful until we got to a certain point of the year called final exams. And now there are some tests and there are the tests that you have to take, and then there's the, the questions that are within them. The questions that I loved were multiple choice, because remember, Taylor had skipping Thursdays, and so at least a multiple choice or true and false, the circling questions, I had either 50% chance of getting it right, or 25% of getting it right. The classes that, the, the questions that I tolerated were long answers. The reason why is because you could just be writing and making things up, and somehow strike gold and get partial or full marks. The questions that I hated, I loathed, I, didn't, I never wanted to see them on an exam, fill in the blank. The reason why, you guys know why, there is only one person who knows the answer and you have to complete the sentence. And there is no way that this guy knew what the answer was. In fact, I didn't know, my mom and dad didn't know, my friends didn't know because they were with me on, on skipping Thursdays. The only person that knew was my teacher. Now here's the thing, everybody in life has tests. Everybody in life has to answer a question. Students have to answer a question. Parents have to answer a question. Your grandparents get this question as well. This is a question that challenges you and I every single day. That here's the thing, you might think that you get it right. You might, but, but at the end of the day, you might get it way wrong. But if you do get it right, and if you stick with the right answer, you will find peace and joy and walk with confidence. It will make a difference in your life. Are you ready for the question? All right, we're gonna do this together tonight. The question is the fill in the blank question. Here we go. Let's fill in the blank. I am blank. What's the answer to that question? How many, who, who here wants to try to shout out the right answer to that question? Oh, I, am. I am what? what? What's the word that you're gonna put in there? Redeemed. You're redeemed. Chosen. Chosen. All right, here's the thing. Here's the question though. Who has the right answer to that question? Do you? Do you have the right answer? Does your parents have the right answer to that question? Does your teacher or your sister or your boss or your brother or your friend have the right answer to that question? See, here's the thing, if you were to ask me my answer to that question, I might give you a few different words. I might say that I'm bold, that I'm driven, that I'm smart, that I'm stubborn, stubborn that I'm unqualified, that I'm strong, that I'm qualified, that I'm broken, that I'm content. Now, many of you tonight might associate with some of those words or all of those words. Well, some of you might say that those words aren't negative enough for you. You might add to your own list failure, addict, hopeless. See, here's the thing. You, you might face this question of who am I? What's, what's the fill-in-the-blank question uh, answer if you get a good grade on a test or if you fail at test? If you get the job or you don't get the job, if you ask that girl out on a date or if you get friend zoned on the spot. Because the word that you put in the, in, in the blank changes absolutely everything. And the question is why? It's because it changes you. Here's what I want you to know tonight, that if God said it, then I believe it. Say that with me tonight. Say God says it, so I believe it. If you, if you brought your Bibles with you tonight, you can meet me in Exodus chapter 19. 
And we're going to be uh, taking a moment, we're going to go back a little bit so we can frame what is taking place. See, by the time we, got, we get to Exodus chapter 19, there is a long history of Israel that's taken place. Abraham was incredibly wealthy, and so his third word at this time might have been rich. Third word also might have been thankful because he didn't have to sacrifice his own son. And Jacob, who thought he would, uh, his favorite son had died, his third word might have been broken. Joseph, who was sold as a slave to Egypt, his third word might have been alone or betrayed. Then he rose to second in command over all of Egypt, and so his third word might have been powerful. Once Joseph died, there became a Pharaoh who didn't know who Joseph was, and he enslaved the Israelites. And then they were forced to build the cities of Ramesses and Python for Pharaoh, and so their third word might have been slaves, abandoned, hopeless, weak. So once God freed the people of Israel through Moses, he takes them to Mount Sinai, and here God speaks to the Israelites through Moses. Remember, this is 400 years of slavery for these Israelites. At this point, what would your third word be? So the God of the universe begins to speak to these ex-slaves, and he says this. He says, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people of the earth. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God says two things to these broken people. He says, one, you're chosen. Two, you're set apart. There are so many different nations that God could have picked, but he says that it's you that I've chosen. It's not because you're large or you're strong that God chose them, but Deuteronomy chapter 7 says that it's because of God's faithfulness that God chose them. Has anybody, when you were growing up, played any kind of pickup sports? How nice is it for you to be picked first on those pickup sports? I mean, it feels so good when they're looking at every single person there and they say, I want you. Because what happens is that you're not just chosen, but you're actually wanted on the team. God doesn't stop. Like, this is exactly what God is, is saying to the people of Israel. They're not just chosen, but he wanted them. And he doesn't stop there. He says that they're also set apart. and set apart for a special purpose. Now let's pause for a moment and let's clarify, just in case we have not grasped this significance yet. This is the nation of people who just came out of slavery that had just lasted about 400 years. And to hear the God of the universe turn around and say that he has picked you first out of every other nation, and that picking you first was not out of pity, but that God had a special plan and a purpose for their life. Listen, this is a revolutionary moment for the people of Israel. Can I tell you something tonight? You might have heard words since you were a child all the way through however old you are right now that does not fit what God has told you. And, and, and it might have actually uh, worked into the identity of who you believe that you are. And, but God tonight, he says to you that you are chosen, that you're wanted, and that he has set you apart for his purpose. We've gotta pause for a moment though. We've gotta ask some big questions. See, for the people of Israel, their third word, again, it might have been slaves or abandoned or hopeless. In God's third word, it was chosen and set apart. So the question needs to be asked, when God's word and everyone else's word is in conflict, whose word do I listen to? When the apostle Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus, he was describing the beauty of, this, of their salvation, and he writes these words. He says, for we are his workmanship. Say that with me tonight. Say, we are his workmanship. I don't know about you, but when I think about workmanship, I think about someone building something. I think about a chair or a table, maybe a car or a house. However, that word that Paul uses to describe workmanship has another meaning. Creator. So the carpenter who built the table would have went out and grabbed all the raw materials and crafted it into his masterpiece. They didn't go to Ikea and get their table and then try to figure out what boat goes where, but they, went out, they would go out to a forest and cut down a tree that would best fulfill the purpose for their project. 
Let me ask you a question. Once the table is completed, does the table have the right to name itself? What's your third word? Wood. It was a joke. Okay. <laughs> the creator has the right to name their creation. Listen, I can call my car Jessica all, like as many times as I want, but all everyone will ever see is a Nissan Altima because the, that's what the creator of my car had decided to call it. What am I saying? When God, what God calls you overrides what anyone else will ever call you and what everyone else, anyone else has ever called you. Let me say that again. What God calls you overrides what anyone else will ever call you or what anyone else has ever called you. You can say or look at your life or someone else might have turned to you and said that you're lost. Well, God turns around and he says that you are found. You might feel like you're broken, but God says that you're a masterpiece. You might feel like you're unlovable, but God says that you're loved. You might feel like you're unwanted, but God calls you his child. You might feel like you're weak, but God says that you're strong. You might feel like you're bound, but God says that you're free. You might feel like you're worthless, but God says that you have a purpose. You might feel like you're nothing, but God says that you're royal. You might feel like you are full of sin, but God calls you forgiven. Why are these scriptures important? Why is knowing that I have worth or that I am perfect in God's eyes, why is that important? It comes back to the top. You remember? If God said it, then I believe it. Now here's the problem. See, we can see all the way through First and Second Kings that, uh, that the people of Israel as a nation continue to turn away from God. Then they would turn back to God. Then they would turn away from God again. Even though God said it, they didn't believe it. And because they didn't believe it, they didn't live out their identity and it resulted in painful situations all throughout the history of Israel. You might look and you're like, well, I feel like this might just be within the biblical narrative, but it actually plays out in your life and my life as well. Let me tell you about my life for a moment. See, when I was in high school, I was told frequently that I was a B student. Many times, in fact, I had a career counselor sit down with me and, and say, Taylor, uh, listen, the best that you're gonna be able to shoot for is to be either a garbage collector or to be in the military. And that maybe, just possibly, potentially, I might be able to get into college. Now, there's nothing wrong with any one of those careers, but there were limitations that were placed on my life. I would see myself constantly in that spot. And in fact, if I got a B, I would, just be, I would be just as happy as if I had gotten 100% on an assignment. Now, because of the things that were communicated with, to me and how they were communicated to me, my third word would have been unintelligent, so I didn't study. Would have been jock, so I spent a lot of time in the gym playing sports. Would have been limited, so I didn't have a positive outlook to the time of the life that I'm living in right now. Then what happened is I gave my life to the Lord. He called me into, the, into his ministry. And then it was then that I began to learn God's third word over my life. That I was made with a purpose. That God was intentional when he made me. That if he called me to it, that he's gonna lead me through it. And my first step for me was to go to Bible college. I got through it, I graduated, and then something else happened. The Lord began to place on my heart to get my master's of divinity. Now remember, limitations placed on my life, the, on my entire life, and career limitations placed on me. My first class is called Christian Theology. Every single fear, every anxiety began to hit me. How did I battle this? One reading at a time one assignment at a time, one class at a time, then you start over when you begin to take the next course. You might get a bad report. Okay, well, what did God say about me? What was God's third word around me? Is learning how to reground yourself in God's truth. So that degree that I have, for me, is less of my accomplishments and more of the testimony of what God can do. Let me ask you a question tonight. What is your third Word. Listen, tonight you might begin to be starting to realize that God has called 
you something different than what you've been called your entire life. Different than maybe what your friends have called you or your teachers have called you. Maybe your parents have called you. Maybe it's something that you have called yourself. How do you overcome it? One moment at a time, one name at a time, one prayer at a time, one day at a time. It's how you overcome it. One moment at a time, one name at a time, one prayer at a time, one day at a time. January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed into the act the Emancipation Proclamation, which uh, set free the slaves all the way through America. However, the slaves that were in the South had no idea that they were free. It wasn't until June 19th, 1865, that Major General Gordon Granger rolled into Galveston, Texas, two years later, with the proclamation in hand, declaring that they were free. As in some of you might have heard whispers of living a whole new identity, but up until this moment, not until today, did you realize that it might be possible. Can I tell you tonight that you don't have to go back that you don't have to live bound by what someone else might have called you, but you can live your life that is defined by who God has called you to be and that you can see that's firmly grounded in Scripture. See, as amazing as that pro, uh, Emancipation Proclamation might have been, there were some slaves that actually turned around and went right back to work in the plantations because it was all that they knew. I tell you something tonight. Don't go back. Step into that freedom that God has for you by stepping into the identity that God has for you. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And the worship team, what they're going to do is they're going to begin to sing a song. When that happens, the lights are going to come up just a little bit. And on your way in, you would have received cards that look just like this. Has everyone received a card that looks like this? Most people, hopefully everybody. This is what I challenge you to do. Take a moment. Pray. What is your third word? What is the word that God is saying over you? Write it down. Maybe for you, you know the scripture that goes along with it, then write the scripture underneath that as well. See, you might have heard that you're broken or hurt or unwanted or addicted your whole life. You also might have heard positive words as you were growing up. And God also calls you whole, he calls you perfect. He says that you're set apart. He says that you're wanted. And earlier, we had a, had, had a slide up on the screen, and that's going to go back up in a moment just to help you out. However, I want to recognize that this message also might have brought up some pain and hurt from the past in your life. If that's the case, we have some prayer partners who are ready all the way across the back who are ready and eager and excited to pray for you, begin to speak God's identity into your life. And so when the lights come up and the worship team starts praying, once I'm done praying, I encourage you, if that's you, to go and see one of our prayer partners in the back. So Lord, I just thank you tonight for who you are. And God, I ask that tonight that we would understand the identity that we have in you. that although one person or another might have spoken something into our life, that you speak something different. You call us your children. You say that we're loved, that we're cared for, that we're forgiven, that we're royal, that we're set apart. So God, tonight, my prayer is that every person in here would begin to hear from you the word that you have for them. In your amazing name, amen.